So I've got some new PCBs from PCBay. Thank you very much PCBay for sending these to me at no cost. So it's sponsored by them. And these are for my project which I've been working on for months and months and months. And this is the final revision of the board which should correct the problems I had with the previous revision where I've made some mistakes. And anyway, these are fixed now. I hope. I still still one mistake left on this board but it's only really minor. Well, I forgot to update the revision number. Got revision 2, so 2.1 on the board here. Not a big deal. But so thanks PCBay for supplying these. Make sure you go and check them out because they've been really good for me and looked after me quite well. I've always been happy with the service, so make sure you go and check them out. Use the links down below. So this is a multifunction board. Now, I actually designed this originally for my keypad module with the FarmTech unit. I'm just going to grab one. So it was originally designed for this unit here. All right, and here's the board, the previous revision, which is stuffed up here. That's vision 2, this is vision 2.1, I've just got some corrections on it. So this was actually meant for this, but then I realised I can actually use it for something else too. Another part of the project, which is currently in this box. Okay, this is all handmade, this is using Vero board, you know, Perth board stuff in there. It's very compact. Obviously this needs to be done in a better box and that sort of stuff and, and made a better system to be in line with this. It's got a USB port on there for a keyboard interface, you plug a keyboard into it and then it allows you to put information into this screen which then submits it through the network. So that's basically what it's doing. And then it gets the data back off the network, displays it on the screen to confirm and that sort of stuff. So it's two-way communication. Anyway, this board can also work in here. Although I designed it for this originally, it occurred to me that I can actually use this for these as well. So I'm going to make this board up. I haven't actually figured out exactly how to do it yet. I know it's capable of doing it because it's got a lot of similarities between this and this. They do a lot of the same functions. It's got the same networking interface, Instead of having a serial interface going through this cable here through a timer, that plugs into the timer normally, that's a serial interface there. This is a serial interface to go to the keyboard controller. So they both have serial interfaces that really just a case of remapping the pins to suit this board. And plus the benefits of using this board is I've also got the design basically pinned down. Things like measuring the voltages and that sort of stuff where I've got a voltage divider here so I can see what the battery voltage is and stuff like that. The idea is I actually use another one of these cases. Because it doesn't have a keyboard interface, this bit would have stayed blank. What I've got to do is basically put the screen in here and do the same thing I've done on the back there with a switch and antenna and charging port on the side and stuff like that. I can basically copy that design into another box but without the keypad. So before I do the electronics side, I'm going to start with the hardware a little bit. I've already prepared slightly. This is a Perspex window. It's actually the offcut of the other box I did with the keypad on it because it comes in 80 by 80 piece. So I've got to cut it in half and this half will fit in here. All I've got to do is glue that in and that will form the window for it at least. So what I'm using here is actual clear nail varnish. It's acrylic nail varnish. Now acrylic is actually what the Perspex is. Perspex is acrylic. Now I've got to do this fairly quickly otherwise it will dry and evaporate off. Make sure it all the way around. Mustn't be any gaps. Now yeah, let's drop this in. Now this piece, when I cut it, I didn't quite get it exactly in the middle. So it's very slightly smaller than the window it's got to go into. So I've just got to make sure it's kind of centered and that should be fine. Let's get that pressed down. That can now just sit in there just like that. Once it's dried, I can peel that paper off the backing and then run another bead around the outside and make it a little bit stronger. That's why I bought nail varnish. Wasn't to paint my nails, honest. So other parts I've already printed out in preparation. These are the spacers for the LCD. And here is the bezel for the LCD. I've already printed these out, ready to go. So these are ready to go on. Obviously I've got hardware and stuff like that laying around as well. I've got some little ribbon cable things already here as well. I've got some longer ones too. I've got all the bits together I need. I just need to sit down and actually do it. Now because this isn't actually exactly the same as the keypad version, there are some differences between what I actually need to populate on the board. So the keypad version, look at the top side instead, we have a socket on here which I use for the 3.5mm TRS cable which normally goes to the timer. So that doesn't need to be populated. Now because I'm getting serial data straight in I don't need to populate that. And also on the other side of the board where the communication comes through here goes through some other parts here. I don't need to populate those either. So I don't need any of that. I can just go straight in. So all I've got to do is hook up my serial interface into this header and I can just use that as an interface. Pretty easy. So I'm doing as I did before, just using the sample books for these. There's other parts I don't need to populate as well. Like there's, there's also a buzzer on here as well, which means I don't have to populate that. Or the service mount transistor which runs that buzzer as well, which is over here. So there's a few parts I don't actually have to worry about populating. So I need to be a bit careful about what I actually pick in case I accidentally populate something which I actually don't need to populate. Alright, so I need a 22k resistor just down here, so we get that one first. Get one there. And we also need a uh, 240k resistor, so I'm going to grab that one in here. These are my voltage divider. 
grab one of those too, just to get that. Of course, they're both land upside down, you know, that's what they do. I think I've got some other visitors I might need to populate too, actually, some 33s. I'll get to those. So, what I'll do is put a bit of flux on here and um, then put a bit of solder on each pad, probably. Some of this just using um, solder paste. Now, I do actually have some solder paste somewhere, but I don't tend to use it. And of course, right now, I can't find it, can I? So, let's start off with putting a bit of solder on here. I've got a fan going, so it's going to be a little bit noisier. So I've got 22 first, which is this one. The only thing about this is that I'm not left-handed. But I have to solder this way. So <laughs> that one, let's get the other one. So what I'll do is I'll put a bit more solder on the other end. Then I'll use hot air to flow it. Like that. I mean, yes, that's on now, but if she's hot air, let's get them set down properly. So I can hopefully do without blocking the camera too bad. Probably a little bit too cold. I was a bit gentle with it last time I used it. Here we go, now it's moving. Cool. That's those down. So other ones I want, these 33Ks over here, those are used for the programmer interface, so yes they do need to be fed. It doesn't have to be 33, just a value I chose, because it's a value which I don't use very often, which means I'm not likely to run out of these particular parts. And the same thing, a bit of flux on there. Use the soldering iron, put each side down. Hopefully I can get this in shot nicely. It's a bit hard trying to record this, unless I use the microscope or something instead. There's possibly, uh oh, that part of the thing flinging off, gone. Felt it hit my finger. Don't know, can't see it. Let's get another one. That's a shame. Hate wasting parts. Let's see if we get a better camera shot on this. Might we give this a try, see if we can see a bit better with this. Yeah, I need to get this flipped over. It's upside down. There we go. Fit that with hot air as well. We'll do it from the left hand side instead. It might be a bit easier for a camera shot. Okay, done. Sweet. So this one's done. Okay, so now I think that's the resistors done. Now you can do the capacitors. These are basically the coupling caps. So you want some 68s and some 100 nanofarads. The values aren't too critical, it's just decoupling caps. It doesn't have to be 68, it's just I like to choose a couple of different values. So do the 68s first. Now these may not all be needed, but well, these decoupling caps, so everything I'm assuming will need a decoupling cap on it. So there's a 68 there, there's a 68 here. So get a couple of these out. Luckily with these ones, orientation is less of an issue because it doesn't matter to be upside down. I'll do the same thing as before, stick a bit of solder on one pad. Side. Then we'll use hot air just to make sure they're actually going. Right. That's not going. Here we go. Okay, hot air. Just to open those down. I think it's just 100s I need next thing. Alright, so 100s, let's find those. So there's one up here, and there's one here. And there's one here. Okay. Is that side done? On this side. Now because I'm not fitting the buzzer here, 
this top one here, the 100 nanofarad here, I don't actually need to fit that because that's there purely to help smooth out the spikes and noise from the buzzer. Because the buzzer runs off this supply, which is what well, runs on those two pins, which then come over here, which come to this pin over here, which has already got a filter on it. And there's nothing else on that line unless you're doing programming. And then there's only a light pull up as well. So it doesn't actually need any filtering unless the buzzer's installed. So I'm not going to worry about installing that one there. This one here I'm going to install because that's going to the wireless system. So that needs filtering, so I'm going to install this top one. I've already put some flux on there. Let's just put a bit of solder on. Again, these part values aren't critical. It's just a generic value just to give it something. It doesn't have to be 100 nanofarad. It could be something else. It could be 200, you know, whatever, 82. And you could tune it and actually play around and figure out exactly what it needs by analysing the circuitry and just tweaking it. That's the proper way of doing it, but generally you whack in some jelly bean numbers and that'd be fine. That's usually what you need, so just something. Okay. So that's for the surface mount parts. Now I start doing through hole. So I'll do as I did before, I'm just going to get some of this header and sit it on here in order to stand off the ESP32. Now the reason I'm doing this regardless is because although it would be nice to have a lower sitting header and have the ESP32 right on, on the board itself, sometimes when you program it you've got to take the thing off the module. I found that with um, many other devices. I've time plugged the ESP32 as one program because some of the connections on the board are actually affecting it. If it's okay after this, so maybe I won't bother after that, but cut that to length. Then I'll get an ESP32 and get it all lined up. Trim this off to make it a bit tidier. Get an ESP32 in there and that will then line it up. I mean, really, I could probably try and buy headers of the right length and I'd have to cut them down, but it actually works out cheaper to buy these longer ones and cut them down to length. It saves you a little bit of money. It's, you know, not much, you're talking about a dollar or something, but if you've got an opportunity to make it cheaper, why wouldn't you? Night so is all sitting here like that. Now I need to get an ESP32. I've got one here somewhere. Are these the right ones? Yep, that's what I'm going to be using. So I'm going to use this as an alignment tool. So I'll stick those pins in there. Stick those pins in here. Yep, push that in. That now is definitely lined up to the ESP32. It's definitely right. So now you flip it over and solder it on. So I'm going to do is put a bit of flux on this one. I'm going to use a flux pin this time. Rather than the other flux, because I don't need to stick the components down. I just need it to help it fly. Alright, give it that. Put this in place. Like so, this is propped underneath from there to help hold it up. And let's solder some pins. I'm also pressing down to make sure it's definitely level. So we get it secured first, then I'll go around and do a nice job of soldering it on afterwards. So you've got to get the flow through the ball and that sort of stuff. Okay, that's two. Take the opposite end. So it should definitely be nice and flat on the board now, and all good. Alright, so solder the rest of this up. It doesn't matter, I've got the ESP32 plugged in backwards. It's purely for location anyway. All right, so if I unplug that again, it actually goes that way around. It actually goes this way. And that's the orientation it has. Which is why it's got this section of the board here, which isn't actually coated in copper. I'm trying to minimise reflections, because of the Wi-Fi antenna being on this end. I'm trying to minimise reflections to the Wi-Fi antenna, because that can actually have an adverse effect to the signal. I'm actually not going to put a header in here, that goes straight to the display. So when I put the display module, we go straight on the back of that. This has to have a header in it. That doesn't matter. These caps are what will populate. There's a few capacitors on there, and they populate all those. But there's not much left to do on this board. I've got to get the voltage drift ladder, and those are these little switch mode supplies I found. So I've got to do that. I've also got to modify the very slightly to change the way that the uh, pre-installed pins are set, and I need to take those out. So this is the little five volt DC DC regulator, which I'm going to be installing. As you can see, it's got header pins on there now. When I did the original version in this other box, which I put away now, I had it standing up on the board like that, just for simplicity. Now what I found though is that this tended to get in the way 
it was a hindrance. So I ended up having to take it back off again and stand it on the board like that, which is why I actually designed the footprint that way anyway, so using a 705 package footprint. So if I do need to lay it down, I can just lay it down and save some space. So that's what I'll be doing, is I'll be laying it down the board. So let's try and get this header off here. There we go, that's off. And what I'll do is get some straight header instead and I'll shove that through and then stick it onto the board. So I'll put a straight header through there and shove that onto it and that'll be that done. Okay, so there's the male header I'm going to shove on there and then that will then pass through these holes. Flux on there. there. I'm also need to put flux on this one, that's going to be done too. One pin solder first, and I'll check the alignment. It's way off. You get it straight now. Cool. So we'll try and get the solder to flow through the board. Now we've got to uh, get this regulator on there. So, I mean, I did I'd open his holes up. I could probably do that with a bit of wick, actually. Let's try that, shall we? Get for extra flux. See if we can get that off. Might be able to. Maybe I'll suck the holes out with that. Never know. Let's have a try. Sometimes it works. Got two of them cleared. Just trying to get the third one cleared. Yep, that works. Cool. So I should drop that over now, like that. And that can then sit slightly off the board, just very slightly like that. Let's see, I've got a very, because it's got some components on the back, and it gives it a little bit of clearance. Okay, it sits down a little bit low, but try and get it parallel at least. Nice. That'll do. Through it. That one through. That one through. Done. Now, because I've got so much pen sticking out, I'm going to cut those off just a bit tidier, just like a piece of wire or something like that. Okay, so that's the rig layer in place. I need to put in this header mounting here for the connector. I've decided to go to the long cable which I had before because I should actually have more room inside. I don't have the cable in there for the SD card, so that actually gives me a bit more space. So, and having a long cable means I can move it around a bit more easily and assemble it a bit more easily in some ways. So, there are benefits to having a long cable, but if I find this is a bit hard to get in there to fit, like I did on the other module, I'll swap to the shorter cable in case I just plug it in, it's not hard. So, I'll just do that. But I thought I'll give it a try first. So I've got to put that in there. I've also got some join line header to go in as well. Let's sort of go in these holes just here. So I'll put a bit of flux on those as well. So these are things I need to get soldered in. Again, I've got to get it to flow through the board, so I'm putting plenty of dwell time on there to get it to flow. If you're only doing a single sided ball then you don't need to put this much time onto it. It's only because I'm trying to get the heat to go through the ball. Also getting the solder to travel down the pins. So it goes right through that way. Okay. Now let's do this header. The footprint for this header is actually, I don't like it that much because the pad size around the holes is actually really small. I'm actually tempted to see if I can find a different footprint for these headers. Soak up the worst of this flux before I actually start doing things like washing it. 
just makes it a bit easier. So that's that side. Now I need to look at doing these capacitors. The current keypad controller, the actual USB host, that runs at 5 volts. I do have a header position here for 5 volts and ground, or VN and ground, but that's actually 5 volts because it's running from over here, and I can connect into that. And then I've only need to have put a header over here for the serial connection. So these buttons aren't used, so I can ignore those but press button locations. Right, so we installed the electrolytic capacitors here. This other header here as well is also installed. That's the programming header for the wireless. I think we're just about ready to start assembling actually. So this is the module I'm going to be using here. So I need to sort of decide how I'm going to hook this up. So it actually requires three wires. Positive, negative and a serial communication. It's not using the RXN, it's only using TX out which is just sending serial data to the ESP32. What I actually need is these three wires here. The orange wire is not used. And it's a bit annoying that the red is not DC, brown is DC. Anyway, it doesn't matter that much. So I could either wire straight onto this board and then because I've got a plug on this end, so I'm not overly worried by it, you know, I can still unplug it, which means I could just wire straight onto here. I like to make sure everything's plugged in so I can unplug things and replace parts if needed, that sort of thing. You now future proofing for repairs is to unplug a module, plug another one in and carry on. So I think I will just shove wires straight into this header because it's only three wires straight in here rather than messing around with doing header sockets here, the male header pins and soldering on, heat shrinking and you now could come loose or get bad connections. So I was going to go straight into the board and that'll do just fine I think. So that'll be those covered. The screen is covered anyway, it's just solder straight on as well. So I'll give this a clean up as well soon. Okay, so the next thing I'll do is uh, convert one of these displays. Now I've shown you previously in videos the conversion I do. Um, I've actually demonstrated it. Because this is an SPI display, I need to convert to I2C. Because that's what I'm using on this board. I mean, I could have used SPI. I thought it was easier to using SPI for the SD card. But I didn't want to share buses. I wanted to have a dedicated bus for each device. Just to potentially remove any conflicts that could arise. And to simplify things in a way. So I need to convert this to I2C. Which is fairly easy. I've demonstrated in previous videos. I might even link it up there or something. Down the description maybe. I've done a video calling, um, what is it? Convert OLED to, S, uh, to I2C from SBI or something like that. Convert OLED display. I can't remember exactly what it's called now, but I've done videos for it anyway. So I'm not going to repeat that. I'm just going to tell you I'm doing it. I'm not going to show you the whole thing again. But just for the sake of completeness, I'm going to describe it. Okay, so under here are some resistors which are not populated. These are zero ohm resistors, so they're just jumpers. And there's also a resistor over here to change. So there's some information just here. So SPI using R8, which is over here. And I2C uses R9, 10, 11, and 12. Well, R9, 10, 11, and 12. Right, so I'll put jumpers in those and move that resistor over. And that's that done. Pretty simple, really. Right, display has been converted. Now we move on. So, what I need to do now is actually mount the display on this back of this board here. And hopefully, it will actually work so I'm not have to take it back off again. So, I need a four pin header. So, four pin header. And I need to solder this onto this board and onto this one. So actually what I need to do is look at these pins here. It's only using four pins obviously. So ground, VCC, SCK and SDA are the four pins we're going to use. So I'll solder it onto the display and then push it through, solder it onto the back of that. And then that's that bit done. Do the same as before. Get one pin done, make sure it's straight. And bed it down properly. Then we'll do the rest. Go through. Okay. Is that done? Now you can see I've already got my spacer sitting here ready to go. So we can get that and just drop it in place through those holes. Like that, and that'll sit on top of the spacer, and that's how it's mounted. It's all got to sit in alignment. Once it's in alignment, it will just sit there quite nicely. Now, one thing I've got to do is when I'm soldering this, I have to make sure I solder it straight because you can see it does have a bit of play in there. So, I need to make sure that when I attach it, I've got to get it straight. Is that straight ish? And it's to the ground. Come on, I'll get this heat through the board. Ok, 
okay that's tacked on it's not great it's only barely on is it straight yep that looks straight it still depends it's going to be pressed down slightly anyway when it's bolted in place but i'm trying to make sure it's as accurate as possible to start with Any chance to flow through. The ground is the hardest one because it's got such a big ground plane on both sides of the board. This one is actually hardest to get to flow properly. Might need a bit of flux on that, it's looking a little bit messy. Is it still straight? Yes it is. Excellent. So that's all good. Let's clean this one up. So I think we're just about there now. I mean that's the display mounted up. I think really all really good now is put it into the box. And then also got the, the box side of it, the mountings and stuff that go in there. But that's on the other side of the box anyway. So this side is just the um, screen mounting, so that will now, once I've peeled the paper off, that will sit in there. And there's the spacers. So we've got it to sit just properly on that side, it's not sitting there, there we go. Alright, so it sits on there just like that, and that means this display is actually sandwiched quite nicely. It's supported fully, and that sort of stuff. So that's the idea, is to be really close fitting. So these are the screws. These are 2.5mm by 10mm which is uh, what I need to fit in here nicely. So let's just drop it through there. And it gives me a nice depth on the post. So there we go, let's push all those in line. Yes, I've got still to hook up the DC power supply side of things, but I can do that once it's in the case, because I can solder from the top. And now on there. So that's all those, so you can see where I've got to put those screws in. So I was going to get that lined up, Push up towards the top as much as I can, I think, and then put those screws in. So I got all assembled, and I thought, I think, why is there a big gap there? Because I forgot this bezel, didn't I? This bezel's got to go in there too. So I'm going to show you that part as well. All right, so there's a bezel prepared. I put the logo down the side there. Now let's get this back out again, since I already assembled it. And I was thinking, why is there a gap? It's not supposed to be a gap. That's why. Is, that's why it's a gap. Mr. Bezel. A bit dumb, anyway. Never mind. It's not a big deal. Let's get this out and I'll put the bezel on and show you that part. Okay. So also we'll take this protector off. Fit the bezel on, which just pushes over. It's a push fit. Look at that, beautiful. And drop that back in. And I'll just get a couple of screws in and I'll flip it over. There you go. There's a display and I've got the logo slightly offset. Mm. I guess I should fix that. So I have to shift off the uh, sticker a little bit, move it slightly to one side, but that's not a big deal. So that's that part. So it's sort of 90% there now. Getting there. So now I've got to think about how I'm going to mount these parts in the, in the box here. So I've got the wireless module, which is going to sit in the bottom. Now when I did the previous one, I actually had it on its side, like this. But I found this piece kind of got in the way, so I think I actually, this time I'll orientate it this way around and have it sitting down like that instead. And then this can always fold over in either direction to get it out of the way, that should be okay. I'm trying to keep it waterproof as well, as water resistant as possible, so if I had a big hole on the side or anywhere else, um, there's a risk that water could get in through it. Well, obviously if I've just got a, a small hole, 
the chance is much less. So if having a small hole somewhere with the cable coming through it, maybe like a slot at the bottom maybe, that would be an idea. But I've also got to allow for batteries as well, we'll get batteries in here. So I've got to get, ideally I want to get three batteries in. Two would be enough, but three would be better, because it's got to run the keyboard as well as this thing, so it's a little bit extra current draw compared to the other unit. So I need to keep an eye on that side of it. So I'm kind of unsure of how I should do it. I mean, I could probably maybe slide up the side like that and have the cable come in and then snake, snake in. Yeah, I need to think about this. So I've got the double battery pack here. I don't have triples, but I do have some individual ones. So I could always put a third one in with it. Now, because I don't have a keyboard to worry about, I've actually got more space inside the box, which is great. It means I can actually bring things right down to the bottom. Um, these don't quite fit in between those posts, which is a real shame. It's the mounting post that doesn't quite fit in there. Yeah, I think I might have to be two batteries again. So it's not hitting the top of the case. So that's fine. So I can actually go right to the bottom. So I could use all this space down here. I'm definitely sort of leaning towards having a slot in the bottom of the case just here for the wire to come through for the USB. Kind of my preferred way rather than a big hole on the side of the case. There's a screw hole there I could bolt to. That gives me a mounting. And I could just run the cable down. I reckon that might be a good way. I could, I could run the cable around here. I could use that as a strain relief. So the cable comes around like that and then comes down. And that will screw straight onto that post. Tuck those out of the way like that. Yeah, I'll figure it out. I can't sound nice. So there you go. I'll just run it around. I'll put a screw in here to hold it in place. And that's actually fine. I mean, that's not going to be... It's not going to go anywhere. So I think I'm actually pretty happy with that. I don't even want to run right past the Wi-Fi antenna because it might induce noise in the wires and I don't want to have that happening either. So I think that would be alright if I just tuck them down like that. That's all out of the way. That'll do. Right, let's get this whole drill of all these started. Let's get it positioned. This is to allow for this, which is a cover for the uh, switch on the back here. This is the power switch. And it's a rubber boot, so it's going to be weatherproof. So I have to make sure I'm away from the edges enough to be able to get a, a seal because it's got like an O-ring built into it. You think this bit might be a bit blunt? Maybe I'll go a bit faster. Okay. okay, so that's that. So that should line up with that. Let's try it. Let's get the switch. That should miss everything. Just make sure. Yep, that's fine. That's positioned nicely. No edges there, so that will tie up nicely. And make that weatherproof. At least that part will be. Now I've also got to do the power socket on the side as well. So I'm going to actually put this on the side underneath this edge, try and give it some kind of shelter. These are, should be pretty sealed anyway. I mean I don't think there's any real way through. I mean blowing into that there's nothing coming out the other side so I think they are pretty much sealed anyway. I could always make a little rubber boot for that or something to actually seal it. So I'm going to stick that on the side there. It's like I did in the other units. And that will again come through the side over here. So I've got to drill a hole for that. I've also got to drill a hole for the wireless unit here. Which I think is the same size drill bit. I really need to make sure. It might be slightly bigger actually. So we'll do that one. So I need to get this positioned with a big enough offset to not hit anything. The other unit I built was on the side because I put the thing sideways like this. And so it sat there quite nicely like that. Just off the bottom. But this was kind of interfering with things. I just cleared things, so I just want to do it this way around instead. But if I lift it up, it might interfere again. So it's clearly a battery pack anyway, and it gives me space to put another battery pack next to it if I want to. I think I'll drill a hole right there and dismount this slightly elevated. I'm going to have to drill from this side. I'm going to have to start with a smaller bit, I think, just to help me get it centered properly. And let's just take a guess. Let's say about there. I'll come back once I've got this one though. You don't see the whole thing, do you? Okay, hole is drilled. I've got it roughly positioned. It's just in place. Now, it does actually allow me where it is. I can just tip it anywhere I want. All right, so I could have it sideways if I wanted to. It'd be all right. But it will fit better that way. So that's what I'm going to do. But what I'm going to do is also going to seal it. I'm going to basically glue it in, in that position. So I'd have a waterproof uh, seal at least around the outside of the threads just to try and help the waterproof as much as I can. Okay, I've got it uh, in positioned. I've got it through the thing there. I've put some of that you know, polished stuff on there. And now it's tying it up. Get it in position and just tying it. 
get it nice and secure. That should do it. I'm trying to get to dig into the plastic a little bit as well on the other side. So it doesn't want to spin, which is fine. So that should be good. I reckon that'll be alright. Once it dries, it'll be basically glued in place and sealed. And I'll be happy enough with that. Now it's going to be hanging off this connector. There's not much weight on it though. It might not be a problem, but I'm tempted to maybe hot glue underneath here just to support the end, just to keep it a bit more bracing. I just like to make these things robust. So the next thing I'll do is this uh, DC jack. I think it's about 7.5mm, so I'm this is a 7mm bit I was going to use. I think about 75 though. But it's got these flats on the sides. Not like it matters anyway, because I'm going to be gluing it in basically. But I need to just get it in here, in a spot where I can still get the nut on it and stuff like that. It's not going to be in the way, so... Yeah, these are bigger. Let's go bigger. 7.5mm. Now what I might do, if this is close, then I might uh, slot it. Yeah. Because it's got the flats on the side, so I'm just going to try and slot it by basically pushing downwards with the drill. To get in there and just go down with it. And that should create a slot, which I can then use. That might just be big enough. Yep, yeah, perfect. Push foot. Simple as that. Okay, and I've got clearance on the inside to get these connections done up to the switch. Tighten this up. Use tweezers for the time being. Let's get it most of the way there and I'll get under some pliers. Probably. Nah, that's probably right actually. Tweezers probably do enough. Alright. That's also the advantage of slotting it. It means it didn't want to turn as I was trying to uh, do the nut up. It did turn a little bit, but not much. But that's fine. That's exactly what I'm happy with. That's all in there nicely. So things are coming along. I've got most of the stuff inside here now. I'm just doing the DC connection over here. And soon I'll be able to do some testing, actually set up the voltage regular over here. Make sure this is working correctly before I put anything else in there. Very soon. Not far away at all. You notice I've twisted this wire here for the power supply. That just helps to keep a bit of noise out. It doesn't do much, but because I'm using, using Wi-Fi and other wireless stuff, it could introduce noise into the system, so it just helps to minimise that a little bit. It's not a big deal. Um, every little bit might help, though. I haven't done it on the batteries, though, but I probably should have done it. BMS is mounted over here, a bit of double-sided tape. I'm probably going to use some hot glue as well, just to help reinforce it, just in case that tape gives way. I don't want it falling off, although it's fairly rigidly held by these two wires here. There's a DC connector wired up to that board. That's an adjustable voltage regulator, back converter, main power switch here. I'm using a shock key diode. That's to stop any backflow into the voltage regulator if you're running for battery. That way, if you're running on batteries, you can't have any voltage going back in here and wasting power and causing a drain. Just a precautionary thing, I found it did actually make a difference, so I've, I've do that every time. This is a massive shock key, it's like a 5 amp shock key, way bigger than I actually need. Um, it's ridiculous, really. That's just what I've got, so that's what I've been using, is that size. Could, you know, a 2 amp one would probably be better. So that's all that done, wiring there, BMS wired up to the battery pack. So I have to do on these battery packs is I have to add a wire onto the middle cell and also have to do some soldering on these button tabs because they don't actually touch the batteries. The 18650s have got re recessed caps. So what I'll do is I'll put some solder on those and that way it's got a lump on it so the battery can then touch it. What I really need to do now is hook up power to this, set this voltage regulator here up, make sure it works, and set that to a decent voltage, so about 9 volts or so, 9.5 volts I think I found worked quite nicely, about 9.5 volts on there, measured at that point in that shocky, and then very far I've got 5 volts over here, and hopefully it will be good. Okay, moment of truth, let's get the meter going, get this ready, power over here, let's plug that in, see if anything goes bang to start with, let's see what we've got coming in, 18 volts coming in, and what we've got coming out of the regulator right now, about 12. Probe on there a bit better. And let's jump around a little bit. Let's turn the switch on. Oh, I can hear a noise. Which is interesting. Hmm. Well, let's just uh, look at setting the voltage on this thing. Probe in here. Probe on there. Got 14 volts coming in, so let's drop that down. I 
sure what is down. There we go. All right. That seems awfully jumpy, actually. Hmm. Seven, twelve, no, that's way too much. Eight, come on, I want about nine and a half. Hmm. Yeah, okay, this is being awfully touchy. Sixteen, why is this being so touchy? I don't know why it's being so touchy though, it's just being a bit weird. I might have to spray some cleaner on that pot on there, maybe a stodgy pot on that adjustment. Well this is being a real pain, I can't seem to get this thing set very reliably. What I might do is put some batteries in here to put some load on it and go from there. Okay, 18650 battery, let's plug it in and we'll test all that part of it as well. It's often a pain getting them to fit put nicely, see if this looks like it's doing anything. Um, it's actually killed a power and we'll see if we've got any power available over here. Currently no. So there's always a bit of a pain getting these bloody holders to work. They're not wonderful holders. Okay, we've got four volts there. That one's making. That one is not. So this cell, this cell here is not making a good connection. This holder's actually a bit tight as well. They tend to not be very good with our springs. Let's try it again. We've got four volts here now. Minus four volts here. Great. So I should have power on this connection. Maybe. It, sometimes it doesn't shut off. It actually shut the batteries off, it's got no power. Yep. Okay, no power on there right now. Well, you couldn't see most of that. Anyway, put power on there now and then take it back off again. Now I should have power on those terminals on the BMS. I do. 8.3 volts because those batteries are fully charged. Okay, so I put that on there now. And now we'll see what we're getting as far as charge voltage on the BMS terminals. 12 volts across there. Okay, let's see if we can get this stabilised. I think this might have a dodgy trimmer on this bloody board. 8.3, that's obviously down. 8.86, there we go. Oh, no, it's dropped again. It's like pressing on it, I'm getting a different voltage. I think it's got a dodgy trimmer on there. So the high voltage in here will come in, that's fine. But the BMS then has to float the negative rail. It lifts the negative rail up to compensate, so it's 5 volts high. It's got to drop 5 volts across the BMS. And um, that could cause it to get hot. So I'm trying to keep the um, voltage difference quite low. I'm trying to keep it fairly close. That's so why I'm on about 9.5 volts. So I've got about 1 volt extra, which allows for the BMS to actually do its thing and float a little bit without putting too much stress on it. But I think I've got a dodgy module here. And that's really annoying because it takes quite a bit to get this thing in there. Right, new regulator is in. Let's try this one out. Let's plug the power in, see if we get any smoke. This one's a slightly um, bigger module. It's actually slightly higher current. 10.3 volts, okay. That's looking promising already. Let's see what we get. Uh, this control actually feels really tight as well. The other one felt quite loose. Oh, look at that, it's perfect, that's easy. Right, so 9.5 volts and no batteries in. Let's pop some batteries in and see what happens. Um, power is coming off. I'm still not convinced these battery holders are much good. They, they're just a bit tight, you have to sort of wiggle them down and get them pressed down. Maybe once they relax a bit, once I've had a battery in for a while, they'll be better, but you know, I just don't like them that much. I mean, it's not pushing down. Let's see if we've got a um, battery voltage down here. I'll need to change our probes again. See if we've got all the cells properly. Yep, and yep, so as both the cells are connected up, brilliant, so that should be working. So I should be able to get the correct voltages over here with and without power on once I turn the power switch on. So 9.3 volts get to come through there, great. Let's pull the power plug, 8.3 volts, let's wiggle this around a little bit, see if it stays on. Yeah, it seems alright. So it's running off the BMS. That's got a high enough threshold there, not 9.5 volts, to be able to do that charging. So that's all good, I'm happy with that. 
I said it should have been the first time around with the other unit. Also, this one's got a bad trimmer. I'm sure that's all it is. It's just a bad trimmer because it's very, very loose. And it's exactly the same type of trimmer as that one, but this one's just really, really loose. It takes no effort at all to turn it. Luckily, this thing's only you know a couple of dollars each, not very expensive. It's probably part of the reason not very expensive. All right, so that's good. So we got power there. Turn the switch back off again. Now I need to verify this bit actually, so let's turn this power back on again. Bring this over here. And I need a ground connection, which is like there. This will have 5 volts going to it, hopefully. But it should be 5 volts right there as well. Those two pins there. So I want to turn the power on. 5 volts, excellent. So that's correct. And I should verify over here, but it should be fine. 5 volts on there too, that's right. So it's looking good. Nothing wrong so far. So I've got an ESP32 sitting right here. Just turn the power back off. And I'll plug this in. This isn't programmed yet. I need to rewrite the software for the uh, module. See the new design. But this should at least give me a 3.3 volt output over here. And I can verify that it's all working correctly. Let's spin it around. Turn the power on. We've got a light. Uh, display probably won't show anything because it's, it's not programmed. But I should be able to get 3.3 volts. Centimeter. There we go, 3.3 volts. So that's working. Nothing's hopefully getting hot. Always place to check that. Feels fine. Yep. Okay, so I think that's all successful so far. I've programmed it now. I updated the software to use the new board. Um, Law's not currently connected up because I don't want to have an antenna and stuff on it and mess around with that. It's not going to work anyway because there's no server running. So it's not got nothing to communicate to. So that's assembled as far as that goes. Let's turn it on, see what we actually get. Fingers crossed. Does it work? Yeah, you've got a display. And the battery level's working. And that's working. Alright. Let me plug a keyboard in and see if that works. Okay, so here's the keyboard. Let's turn it off for the time being whilst we're messing with it. Plug that in. Turn it back on. And then we'll try it out, see if it's actually going to behave. In theory it will. Yep, that's working there. Class number. Yep, okay, that's working. That's working. That's working. That's working. All right, it won't be able to communicate because uh, there's no connection with the wireless and um, the server's not running, stuff like that, so we'll give an error. But it's working. The law stuff should work excellent. So that's that built. Winner winner chicken dinner, as Dave would say. So subscribe, click the bell icon, all that sort of stuff. I'll probably be doing some more videos. I've got some more to do anyway, so um, I've got quite a bit to do. So thank you very much, PCB Away, for these. Very much appreciated having the sponsorship. And uh, the actual financial sponsorship has allowed me to buy a bit of test gear as well. So that's been really helpful, which is what the channel's about trying to buy things to fix them and share it, you know. Self-supporting, that's what I'm trying to go for. If, if you're interested in becoming a Patreon, there's links down below for that. And at the end of the videos, on the end screens, there's, there's little banners on there for Patreon if you want to support me through Patreon and help, to, help me to uh, generate more content. And I really appreciate all the Patreons I do currently have. They've been very helpful. Thank you much. Catch you later. See you next time. It's a really tight fit. These sockets are always really tight. Oh, oh god, dropping meat off the bench. Right, let's see what we've got coming in.